Pathogens are microbes that attack all living organisms, plants, animals, and even you and I. When we get sick, we've been attacked by those pathogens. Now, in the garden, we usually don't think about pathogens until a plant gets sick. Once it's not looking right and not growing right, we then go hunting for a solution. Well, if you want to become a better gardener, it's a good idea to understand pathogens before before you have a problem. In this program, I'm going to have a look at what you should do if you think one of your plants are diseased. I'll also look at various DIY home remedies as well as commercial remedies. And then I'm even going to spend a few minutes looking at some of the diseases you can get from the garden. You can pick up microbes from both plants and soil and get quite sick. And it's a good idea to understand that process and the kind of diseases you can get. I'm going to provide this information by using the audiobook version of this book here, my book, Microbe Science for Gardeners. I'll put a link in the description below for places that you can get this book. And it's available as a print book, as an electronic book, and as an audiobook. I hope you enjoy this program. Chapter 14 Pathogens. Most of this audiobook has been about all of the good things microbes do for plants, but most gardeners are more concerned about the pathogens. When things are growing well, nobody thinks about the microbes, but the minute something doesn't look right, the search begins for either an insect problem or a pathogen disease. The good news is that serious diseases in the garden are rare. I have been gardening for a long time and have grown a lot of plants. I have only encountered a few serious diseases. The ones that come to mind include Late blight in tomatoes robbed my whole crop for a couple of years. One of my 15 magnolia trees got verticillium wilt and died. Damping off disease kills seedlings quickly, but was easily prevented with proper cultural techniques and cinnamon. Found a virus on two hostas. Both were discarded quickly. Rhizosphera needle cast is affecting many of my spruce trees. Various fungal and bacterial rots have probably killed a number of bulbs and alpine plants without me ever identifying the problem. I also get some common problems such as powdery mildew on lilacs and black spot on roses, but I don't consider these serious since they don't kill the plants. Many of the spots and deformed leaves you see are caused by abiotic, cultural conditions, not a pathogen. I have some good advice for beginning gardeners. Don't read too much about diseases. It will scare you into never gardening. You will never see most of the diseases that exist. You suspect a disease. What now? One of the biggest mistakes people make when they suspect a problem is to get online and ask for a cure. The question usually goes something like this. What can I spray to save my plant? You will get lots of answers. But none will be right, because you have not yet identified the problem. Unfortunately, many gardeners want to be helpful and give out solutions before they understand the problem. Instead, follow these four steps for both pests and diseases. Step 1. Identify the problem. Until you know what the problem is, you can't possibly find a solution. If you can't see the problem, you can't identify it. Step 2. Research the problem. Understand the issue. Learn about the life cycle of the pest. How does it live? How does it reproduce? What does it eat? And most importantly, how big of a problem is it? Does it have natural predators that will take care of the problem for you? Step 3. Decide if the problem needs a solution. Most problems in the garden do not have to be solved by the gardener. Many are not serious enough to bother with, and many resolve themselves. Step 4. Find a solution that really works. Most DIY solutions recommended online do not work. List of plant diseases. A table listing some of the more common fungal and bacterial diseases, including their descriptions and suggested control methods, is available in the supplemental PDF accompanying this audiobook. Fighting plant diseases. Most diseases can only be controlled using synthetic pesticides. A few DIY solutions do work and are listed below. Carefully follow the labeled rates for any pesticide. Too many gardeners apply them at higher rates, thinking that this will work better, but it rarely does. Higher rates can actually be less effective. DIY pesticides. 
I am always amazed at the number of solutions that are recommended online, in blog posts, on YouTube videos, or in response to a question on social media. 90% either don't work or have no scientific basis. And yet, readers quickly accept any nonsense that is presented to them, especially if they already have the ingredients. Anything from the kitchen seems to be worth trying. If someone recommends a home remedy but does not provide a link to a scientific study, it probably does not work. If the remedy is very general, like garlic juice is a good fungicide, it almost never works. Remember that there are thousands of different fungi, and no treatment works on all of them. If the solution includes Epsom salts, you definitely know it doesn't work. The following is a short list of DIY solutions that are known to work on plant diseases. Milk for powdery mildew. Milk does work, but there is a catch. It does not stop the disease or reduce the mycelium once it is growing on the leaves. Milk may slow down growth, and it seems to prevent spores from germinating. Try using a 25% solution of 2% milk. Non-fat milk does not work as well. Contrary to so many claims, it has no effect on black spot disease on roses. It also works on downy mildew on cucurbits. The key to using milk is to spray it on the leaves before you see any symptoms, and then to spray weekly to replace the washed off milk. Baking soda for powdery mildew. Baking soda will also work on powdery mildew, and this has been researched by numerous people, including Cornell University, who developed the Cornell formula for this. The exact ingredients are not published, but it is similar to this. One gallon water, one tablespoon baking soda, one tablespoon vegetable oil, two drops dishwashing liquid. These ingredients are mixed together and then sprayed on the plant that is under fungal attack. It is popular because it's simple and most people have easy access to the ingredients. If the oil is left out, it still works but is less effective. Baking soda is sodium bicarbonate and sodium is toxic to plants. It is better to use potassium bicarbonate, but that is harder to source. Chamomile tea. I have used chamomile tea to stop damping off disease in seedlings, and it seems to work. I have not found any scientific study that looked at this specific use of the tea, but the tea has been shown to have mild antibacterial and antifungal properties. Cinnamon. You probably know cinnamon as a brown powder that you buy in grocery stores. It is made by grinding the bark of certain trees. What you probably don't know is that the stuff you buy as cinnamon is not the true cinnamon. The real stuff comes from a special species of tree, and it's very expensive, so most companies use a cheaper imitation. Various types of cinnamon have been tested and show antifungal properties. Cinnamon can be used in a couple of ways. Sprinkling it on seedlings will prevent damping off disease, which is a fungal infection. Once seedlings are infected, it can also stop the progression of the disease to uninfected seedlings. It can also be sprinkled on any cut surface to prevent infection. Orchids can get a bacterial disease known as crown rot. As soon as you see the rot, sprinkle a heavy dose on any parts showing infection. Make sure you get it right down into any crevices in the foliage. It stops the rot instantly. Cinnamic acid is extracted from cinnamon and has been used in commercial antimicrobial products. Neem oil. Neem oil is pressed from the fruit and seeds of the neem tree, Azadiracta indica. It is effective at killing various rusts and powdery mildew spores, but it's less effective against rose black spot, Diplocarpon rose, and other fungal diseases. It does kill virus vectors such as aphids and whitefly. The active ingredient in neem is azadiractin. There are two types of neem. Pure cold-pressed neem preserves azadiractin and is used as an insecticide. Neem is also available with the active ingredient removed, and it is used in food, skin care, and cosmetic products. If you are buying neem, look for a product that specifies the azadiractin concentration on the label. Commercial Pesticides Commercial solutions tend to work better than DIY solutions and have been tested for specific pests and pathogens. The names for different types of pesticides are frequently misused. A pesticide is any product that kills or prevents any pest or disease, including insects, fungi, bacteria, nematodes, etc. It is a general term, and each of the following are pesticides. 
fungicide for fungi, bactericide for bacteria, insecticide for insects, herbicide for plants, weeds, rodenticide for rodents. Products are available in both organic and synthetic formulations. In general, synthetic products are more effective and have been more widely tested for efficacy and safety. Organic products have a more general use but are less effective. Contrary to popular belief, many have had very little testing. There are two classes of pesticides, preventatives and curatives. Preventative products are applied before the pest arrives and the treatment prevents the pest from getting started. Many of these are systemic. Curatives are applied after the pest is present. They generally have little effect unless they can make direct contact with the pest. Fungicides Fungicides are pesticides that prevent, kill, or inhibit the growth of fungi on plants. They are not effective against bacteria, nematodes, or viruses. Contact fungicides, also called protectants, are not absorbed by the plant, but they do stick to the surface of the plant for a limited time period. They provide a protective layer that prevents the fungi from attacking the plant. These products are effective but need to be reapplied as they wear off. Systemic fungicides are absorbed by the plant and once inside are transported to all parts of the plant. Some products are even transported into new growths to provide long-term protection. The timing of application is important. Preventative fungicides need to be applied before there is visible growth of the fungal disease. Many of these are applied in spring as new plant tissue is formed and then reapplied periodically. Curative fungicides can be applied after the disease starts, since they are able to kill the fungi after it infects the plant. Fungicides can work in a number of different ways. They can damage the fungal cell membranes or inhibit a critical chemical process. No fungicide is effective against all fungi. Fungi can develop a resistance to chemical treatments, so it is a good idea to alternate between products to help prevent the development of resistant strains. Organic fungicides. The following are some organic fungicides that are available as commercial products. Sulfur. This fungicide has been used for over 2,000 years, and it is still a viable option. It is effective against powdery mildew, rose black spot, rusts, and other diseases. Sulfur prevents spores from germinating, so it must be applied before the disease starts. Sulfur is available as a dust, wettable powder, or liquid form. It should not be applied with or soon after applying an oil spray, since the combination can harm plants. A lime sulfur spray is a mixture of lime, calcium hydroxide, and sulfur, and is a common dormant spray that is applied before bud break in spring. It is more effective than sulfur alone. Copper Copper kills fungi and bacteria, but it can also harm plants. It has been used for a long time in a formulation called a Bordeaux mixture, which combines copper sulfate and lime. It is a popular spring spray because it adheres well even in rains. This product is effective for a wide range of diseases, but always follow label instructions closely to minimize plant damage. Bactericides Bacteria can cause a number of serious diseases in plants, such as fire blight on pear and apple and bacterial spot on peach, but there are limited options for fighting them. The above-mentioned Bordeaux mixture is one option. The other option is the use of antibiotics, but these are generally not available to gardeners. Available antibiotics include things like streptomycin and oxytetracycline. Both products are more highly regulated than pesticides. The best option for gardeners is to grow healthy plants. Human diseases. Gardening is considered to be a very healthy exercise, but it can be a source of human diseases. The two main areas of concern are soil and produce. Soil-borne diseases. You don't hear about these diseases very often, but there are quite a few diseases you can get from soil, compost, and even peat moss. They can come from garden soil and even so-called sterile bagged soil. Here is a list of some of the more common ones. Valley fever occurs when people inhale fungi that belong to the group coccidiodes, which are found in the southwestern United States. The tiny spores live in desert dirt, and on windy days they can get blown around and inhaled. Severe cases can lead to pneumonia. 
Hantavirus has a high mortality rate and is spread by rodent droppings, urine, and saliva. It can become airborne and infect gardeners. Tetanus causes about 25 deaths in the USA every year, and many more in Asia, Africa, and South America. The bacteria causing tetanus is common in soil, dust, and feces. Botulism is well known as a disease related to infected food, but wound botulism can be contracted from soil. It is a bacterial infection. Brain-eating amoeba kills almost everyone that is infected. The single-celled microbe is found in warm fresh water and needs to enter the body through the nose. Unless the gardener goes for a swim in their pond, they should be safe. Several strains of Escherichia coli, E. coli, cause diseases. One strain, ETEC, accounts for several hundred million cases of diarrhea and tens of thousands of deaths globally each year. Melioidosis is a bacterial infection that quietly causes thousands of deaths each year as people come in contact with mud. Histoplasma is a fungus that causes lung infections and is spreading throughout the U.S. and probably other countries as well. There are lots of diseases and lots of potential exposures, but to really understand the risk, we have to look at rates of infection. The European Union shows about 31 infections, includes all soil-borne diseases, per 100,000 people per year. It is possible that the rate is a bit higher in gardeners because they are exposed more. To put this into perspective, 5,000 out of 100,000 get influenza each year, resulting in eight deaths, and we don't all go around wearing gloves and masks to prevent catching it. The above-mentioned organisms are found in soil, but they need to enter your body to cause infection. This can happen through a cut in the skin, through the mouth, or through the nose. Many airborne fungal and bacteria organisms travel easily through the air. If you don't touch the soil and you stop breathing, you are safe. The risk of these diseases is low and should not be a concern. To reduce the risk of infection even more, wear gloves, keep cuts covered, wear closed shoes, and wash often. But to be honest, there is very little science to confirm the effectiveness of these measures. Diseases from eating produce. You can get sick from eating commercial produce. What many people don't realize is that you can also get sick from eating your own homegrown produce. Any food that comes in contact with soil or the air above soil can contain pathogens. The best way to reduce your risk of sickness is to wash all produce in running water. It works as well or better than all of the other options. If you'd like to learn more about microbes in your garden, have a look at these videos here. Happy garden.